I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name is Gray Miller, and I am a writer and visual practitioner living here in Madison, Wisconsin. What is a visual practitioner? Uh, so the easiest way to think of it is, you know those RSA animate videos, the whiteboard videos you see? Oh, yeah. So that's a part of visual practice. Or if you've ever been to a convention where there's a keynote speaker and then off to the side, there's somebody with a great big whiteboard and they're like drawing and writing in various like sketch note kind of stuff. So I've been paid to do sketch notes. I've been paid to do graphic recording, which is what it is at the meeting. I just got paid to help a UW class create a visual exercise for the students to do. And it's all about taking in that power of the visual and the actual interactive, not just me showing you a visual, which is powerful, but actually getting you the power to make visuals work and then using that to help either create ideas or convey information or that kind of thing. It's one of those things where visual practice kind of is a big umbrella term that covers a lot of different things. Uh, I'm gonna spend about four hours today drawing glyphs for a whiteboard animation company. And like I said yesterday, I was working with UW doing a visual exercise with botany class. I also teach people how to do um, facilitating open space workshops. What do you mean? So uh, in a past life, I was a event planner and a facilitator. Really? Where at? Um, well, all throughout the U.S., Canada, and sometimes in Europe, and is particularly in the field of adult sex education. Okay. And uh, so... Did you go to school for that? Or? No. No. I, uh, <laughs> I, I raised four daughters for that. Okay. Uh, and decided that the sex education that I got and that I saw available was not very good and that we needed to have an upgrade and that there were a lot of adults out there who hadn't had gotten the same kind of information that I'd gotten. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally, it was going to a class, a, a workshop at a convention that was supposed to be an intro to kink kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I'm making little air quotes, which you can't see out there in podcast land. Yes. Um, and I was the AV guy helping them out. I've always been kind of the AV presentation thing. And I walked out of that thing and uh, my girlfriend and I looked at each other and went, we could do better than that, right. you know, in terms of giving a resonation. And that kind of started things out. That was back in 2002, 2003 or something like that. My niche kind of became this open space idea. Now, open space is not particular to sex education. It's a, a way to, instead of coming to an event where people hand you a brochure and say, here's what you're going to be talking about at this time, and here's when you will stop talking about that, and then you will go on and you will talk about this thing. Okay. Um, instead, you walk in and you say, hey, what do we need to talk about right now? What is it that, that you are passionate about? What is a concern of yours? What do you feel needs to be addressed right now? And we go through an exercise, and it is an exercise. It's not just a free-for-all. Um, we go through an exercise that creates an agenda for the day. And this is for the event itself or the people that are hosting the event? Yes, both. Okay. Um, so I have done that's this, what it sounded like. So. I've done this at events as part of other larger events, mm -hmm. and I've also run my own events. I had for a long time... It was called Great Answers Ropetastic Unconference Extravaganza, or the GRU, G-R-U-E. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to say, but yeah, okay. a little bit, a little bit. We did about 100 of those over from between 2007 and 2019. No, 2018 was the last one. Okay. And that was where, you know, travel all over, and I just, I'd come to a community, and they'd have a, a group of people, and they would say, yes, let's do a GRU. And we'd just get a space together, we'd do this exercise, and people would talk about all kinds of things from, you know, how to tie up your partner safely to how to talk to your boss about the fact that you're polyamorous or gender issues or feminist issues or all kinds of things. Basically covering the things that we don't get covered in mainstream most of the time. Okay, so those were two completely different things. So first I'm gonna start with the visual arts one. So first with the visual aspect of what you were talking about. I want to say that I recognize that as something I heard about a while back called visual note taking. So instead of just like writing down notes that are bullet points, what you would do is you would draw something that would remind you of what someone said. Is that the same sort of thing? It's, it's in the realm, yes. It definitely falls under that umbrella. I think it's more popularly known as sketchnoting because of Mike Brody over in uh, Milwaukee. So yeah, sketchnoting would definitely be part of it. The, the, honestly, the, the whole point of it is that 
you know, language is a powerful thing. We can convey ideas and stuff like that, but even more primal than language and even more universal than language are images. It's the science behind, and you know the theory behind cartooning about how the reason we like a smiley face is because we project our, the simpler a face is, we project our own knowledge into that. Yeah. That is what we leverage in this. Mm -hmm. The art of visual practice is to take that power of that iconography and change it into a way to reinforce those ideas and sometimes convey them more easily. I just watched an episode of The Good Place that I'm rewinding and they have a, they, there's a thing in there they say that time is run by Jeremy Baramy. And they're like, well, what do you mean Jeremy Baramy? And they, 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 they point out that instead of being a linear timeline, he draws a script word, Jeremy Baramy. He says, this is what the timeline looks like. It happens to spell Jeremy Baramy in cursive, <laughs> so that's what we call it. And that's a perfect example of okay. iconography and language working together. So, you know, in my work creating glyphs, a glyph is just a simple, think of a stick figure. You okay. know, a, a stick figure motion, a little cartoon showing, uh, illustrating one idea. Okay. Okay, so uh, if, uh, but I have to make decisions about that. If I draw a picture of a leader and it's a person standing on a mountaintop planting a flag all alone, mm -hmm. that is one form of leadership that is there. But what if my version of the leader is someone helping other people get up a mountain? What if it's someone helping find their way through a forest? You know, what is the different archetypes of leader that I put in there? And each one gives a different feeling in that term. So mm -hmm. when I'm working with clients, the idea is to figure out how to use these visual languages in ways that don't get in the way. Because a lot of people, like if I asked you to draw me a picture, you'd be like, no problem, I do web comics all the time, yeah. easy. So that, that kind of uh, visual work is, um, is how we try and, and put that in there and make sure that it doesn't get in the way. Like for example, with this botany class that we did, the, the teacher, Johanna Osterweik, did a demonstration of how to draw the kind of picture she wanted them to draw. And I told her deliberately to make it stick figures, make it really rough, yeah. okay? And I know that she can draw plants better than she did, but she made it really rough to create a space that was safe for the other students to be like, oh man, my drawings suck. Or hey, even make the kids say, kids, listen to me, the college students, the adults, mm -hmm. <laughs> to make them say, oh hey, I can draw better than that. And a lot of them did. We had a f incredible, maybe there was 40 different pictures up on the wall at the end of stories that the people told about the plants that were in their lives. Mm -hmm. So that kind of exercise just makes it a little bit more visceral than just sitting there listening to a lecture. It's the way of projecting the message rather than what the message should be. It's kind of like not releasing anything because it has to be perfect before anybody can see it. Absolutely, absolutely, and changing it and things like that. And so when we do things like the whiteboard graphic recording or the sketch notes and things like that, we are deliberately making things that are there for the people. It's not designed so that you didn't have to go to the keynote and you'll understand exactly what. That's an infographic. That's mm -hmm. a thing for designers. It's a whole other field of expertise. Yeah. What we do is we create things that will spur the memory of the people that were there. They'll be like, right. oh, look, there's that puzzle. That's when he talked about things fitting together, yeah. you know, or that kind of issue. Okay. Um, I, I was hired to go into um, a UW presentation by Dr. Carter was her last name, I remember. And it was at the Fiber Arts Archive that they have here at the UW. And I walked in and I took sketch notes of the thing there and then took the sketch notes into where another graphic facilitator, uh, Julie Swanson and Stephanie Steigerwald were making a great big huge board and my sketch notes gave them the iconography they needed to integrate that into the board. I was covered two sessions. I think uh, Julie covered another two sessions and then Stephanie was running the entire big board. Okay. And so between us, we could have visual representations of all the, the different sessions that happened and integrate them into one big final, I'm gonna use a big German word, Gestamtkunstwerk of, of overarching, overarching work. Okay. Uh, it's my favorite word from... It's a good one, I have to admit. I'm glad you said it. Yeah. Um, thanks, Doug Rosenberg, for teaching me that word. But yeah, that, that particular uh, thing, so it kind of fed into each other. And then, you know, the Dr. Carter li liked the sketch notes I did, and she took a picture of them and enjoyed them. And it was with the fiber arts? What is that? I'm blanking on what the exact title of the place of the place was because you know this was this was like two weeks ago who has memory that <laughs> no, what, are you, what am i thinking uh, <laughs> um it's a uh, there, there is a 
uh, fiber arts, you know, degree program. Obviously, there's, mm -hmm. you know, for people that that work with um, textiles and so it is textiles. Artists. Like I didn't know if like yeah. it could have been like it's for the study of you know raisin bran. No, huh? no, they actually it's, it's really interesting. They take they they find pieces of clothing or like needlework and stuff like that, and they oh. they figure out what this says about the culture, and a lot of times what it says about the culture is we've really treated our children badly. <laughs> I mean, really? yeah, a lot of times that's what it is. The, the different things that they will portray or like a sampler a needle. One thing I remember, the needlepoint sampler was kind of like almost a, a graduation process. Like by the time you could finish your needlepoint sampler, you had enough techniques available that you could move on to, you know, you were considered to be educated in the arts that you needed to know. Because they would have things like alphabets and uh -huh. numbers, and then also different types of stitching and different types of sewing. And since, if you are a young woman of that period, you were expected to know these things. That's how they'd get them together. Okay, and then of course I have to find out how sex education led to this entire thing. I, I was a public speaker and presenter and teacher in the sex ed world, and then you know running events. You know you're the director of an event, or you are the facilitator of a on conference, you're still kind of the center of attention. I, I'm unashamed to be a social justice warlock kind of person, and I'm looking at it and going, you know what, we don't really need another cis head presenting white guy taking up space. Yeah. So when I am doing the visual work, instead of being the cis head white guy who's taking up space and being the center of attention, I am the person with all that privilege who is listening to and witnessing what other people are doing and recording it and making sure that their voices are heard and making sure that's in there. And for me, that's become a much more fulfilling role to play, more of a, a stewardship of information rather than a spreading of information. Yeah. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to uh, listen and hear more voices and then help them get amplified. You said that you saw the way things were in the sex education world. And it kind of sounded like you started you were like, I'm going to create this thing. Uh, I did not create Open Space. That was created by a guy named Harrison Owen back in the 80s. But you started to spearhead this campaign. I started doing it. I was the first one to do it in the, the kink and sex education realm. Correct. Yes. And popularized it and stuff like that. I mean, it's still being done now, which I'm really happy to see. Uh, part of me leaving it was to say, hey, you guys do this for yourselves. Don't just wait for me to do it. I do take some credit for popularizing it within the the kink culture, uh, a kink, a particular kink culture, I should say. Mm -hmm. The GRU itself, um, there's another really great sex educator named Lee Harrington, who's a good friend of mine, and he sat me down one time and said, Gray, you need to have an event with your name on it. Because okay. at the time I was going and presenting it, I was sort of a mini celebrity in terms of kink terms, like uh, people would know my name if I went to an event, but there's also a lot of reputation that goes with that that is not very much fun. And I was still too kind of nervous to actually call it, come to Gray's event. Right. So instead I said, let's make an acronym, you know, Gray's Rope Task, my specialty at the time was doing rope bondage kind of stuff. Okay. And so, you know, Gray's fantastic event. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't do that, so I made an acronym, especially since I'm a big fan of the whole Gru Zork. You lost me. Compu the first computer text game, um, oh, adventure game, okay. it's getting very, very dark. You are likely to be eaten by a I know guru. Zork, but you're... Okay. Right. So see... It took me a second. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that it became the word itself. Be like I, I literally, at one point, was having an interview when someone said to me, so what have you done in the community? And his friend goes, well, haven't you heard of Gru's? And... He looked at him and says, yeah, but what does this have to do with him? Yeah, I was like, well, that, that, that G and grew, that, that's for me. More of the show after this break. A lot of your stuff is, turns out to be communication-based. Firstly, uh, my guilty pleasure is uh, hand lettering and calligraphy. What's, what's some of the things that are like obstacles in doing this that you've had to overcome or that you wish you could overcome? Not to overquote Ryan Holiday, but the whole idea of ego is the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely the issue. It's, I have to be aware of the fact that uh, I'm going to be subjective. I'm going to have my own bias. And tr I, I, there's no way I can be unbiased, but I can try and counter the biases. There's a, a very fantastic graphic facilitator called Kelvy Bird. She's really, really good. So she gets hired by the big name clients. Okay. And there have been times when those clients 
have been parts of organizations or espousing values that she did not agree with. And so then you ask yourself, am I a, a doctor who is supposed to be treating everyone regardless of what they're doing, or am I a publicist who can decide who I want to help amplify their voice? You know, what is my, is it, is it my job to, because I personally object to that? And if I, if it is, if I say, yes, I object to these values and I object to these things and therefore I am not going to do that, then is that different than the cake decorator who doesn't want to make a cake for a gay wedding? And, you know, what is, what is that situation? And, I mean, I can tell you what my answer to that is, which is that the same thing for the, the, the cake decorator absolutely has the right to deny service to someone who they don't agree with their lifestyle. What they don't have the right to is to escape the consequences of denying that. So if the consequence of that is that they're on the front page of the paper mm -hmm. with everyone pointing out how bigoted they are, that's yeah. the consequence. Likewise, I'm somewhat liberal. So if I am hired to do a, uh, a graphic recording and the people that are doing it are uh, from the uh, Young Republicans for Trump organization, and I say, no, I'm absolutely not going to do this, and I walk out, and they put me on the front page of the paper the next day and do that, well, that's, that's my choice. That's something I have to deal with. I have to deal with the fact that I will never again be hired by the Young Trump Organization, and I have to deal with the consequences of that. How are you finding these jobs for the graphic <laughs> visualization that you're doing? Like, you just go, hey, I draw on whiteboards. Can I, want me to do your event? You know, like, how do you do that? And this is where I lunge for the wing and say, I recommend people go to creativegray.me or contact gray at graybillercreative.com. Well, I mean, yeah. it, it, uh, choosing no, that as a career path, I mean. So, okay, choosing as a career path was, I was lucky enough that my partner got a really good job, mm -hmm. a, a really, really good job. It had enough money coming in suddenly that I had the luxury of being able to reduce my workload. To, I mean, originally I was, I was the primary breadwinner doing all these conventions and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was able to stop doing that, and I was able to start doing training. People like Christina Merkley and uh, Heather Martinez and a bunch of online and in-person people, Jill Greenbaum, in this graphic recording stuff. Now, there, there is a link, by the way. The open space world and the graphic recording world, those intersect a lot. So they, they do, it was a natural bridge to that. It's not like I just suddenly one day said, I want to do something different. But to some extent, I did, because I've been known, you notice I introduced myself as a writer first. Mm -hmm. I've been a writer, I've been a podcaster, I've been a performer, I have a degree in dance, you know, I mean these things are, oh, I didn't know that. These, okay. th these things are my, uh, you know, visual, visual stuff. Never was I an artist, except for doodling and sketch noting. I liked sketch noting, yeah. so, but I, again, I looked at that as a personal practice, not a professional one. So now I was trying to shift it into professional mode. Now, what you would normally call living, the amount of money you would have to normally make to have a, a quote-unquote making a living, mm -hmm. I don't have to make that. I have to make enough to pay off some of my bills, which are less than most people's. Mm -hmm. My partner is able to cover a lot of the things that allow me to have this room to grow my, my practice. Yeah. And if that changes, then I'll go back to doing something else. Another thing that's interesting is they have conferences about how to run these conferences. They just recently had their international conference, the International Forum of Visual Practitioners. But I got to meet a whole lot of people there. Another visual practitioner here in, in Madison. It's kind of funny. I, I was there and I met people from Madison for the first time. And so learning a lot from there, I also... I got to see how the lessons that I'd learned from the sex education and event facilitation and things like that could be carried over into the visual facilitation thing. The, the metaphor I talked to you about, about the leader planting a flag, we had a keynote speaker who used that metaphor of planting a flag. And as I was watching it, I was getting more and more uncomfortable with the idea of, you know, this is colonialism. You know, this is, this is going in, taking away some pretending like you're discovering land that already existed and then I'm like right. this may not be the best metaphor I got to have a great discussion with people and it wasn't it was it was a great experience of not calling somebody out and criticizing them it was a great experience in practicing the whole idea of saying hey can we think about this a little bit because I'm not sure that we're you know maybe we should put more thought into it and everybody going yeah hey that's a good thought that's an idea including the person who was the keynote speaker and I was astonished by the fact that someone who works with huge clients IBM you know government organizations was open to that kind of thing mm -hmm. that 
led into just, just kind of me feeling more comfortable about having a voice in this. Because there was that, I'm stepping away from a place where I did feel like I had achieved a level of expertise mm -hmm. and success and deliberately sticking in, stepping into a beginner space where I was very much the new kid on the block. Okay. And it was reassuring to know that I would still have something of value to offer uh, without having to take center stage or something like that. Mm -hmm. like I could just you know, sort of be the person asking the questions. So going forward, what's your outcome? What's your end game? Two words, <laughs> and, I, and I will give credit of the two words to a, a fellow artist and teacher in Minneapolis named Tamara Mantegu. Montague. A long time ago, I was I visited up there, and she was showing me some of her paintings, and she said, "I have found myself a life of creative stability." Okay. And I was like, "That sounds awesome." It does. What is it? so? What does that? So what that means to me? I, I can't. I can't say as well. It's like those two words have like resonated in my mind. That is right. the end goal. Yeah. The the idea of creative stability. It's sort of refined itself there's the realistic goal and then there's the the ultimate goal the realistic goal is to say it's where i have no unmitigatable surprises mm -hmm. you know like i'm, I'm going to be surprised by things but i can handle them i can roll with it i have enough slack you know that i can absorb the shocks to the system that may come and i was a single dad and in, in poverty for most of my life so the idea of that is really a nice one mm -hmm. um, while at the same time still utilizing my creativity and utilizing it in ways that, that fee, they feed into each other, where the ability to make a living with my creativity allows me to explore my creativity more, which allows me to make a better living and not that kind of thing. Not rich, but stable. The ultimate goal with that would be to be able to not have the work that I do be connected to the money I need to make to live. You know, imagine if instead of saying to yourself, hey, I want to do this thing, how can I make money at it? How can I monetize it? How right. can I do that? At the very least, to support the hobby. Where instead of that, it's you get up in the morning, you're like, what do I want to work on today? The biggest lie that I was told growing up was that I was lazy. Mm -hmm. And it was internalized. And if I'm not working, I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. I must, if I don't give myself a job to do or work to do, I must be lazy in doing that. I'm not lazy. <laughs> it turns out that I have so many things I want to work on the problem is I have to choose to work on the ones that will actually bring in money in order to make a living. If I could find a place where I had that stability, and I should say a non-destructive and non-exploitative, um, mm -hmm. okay, because sure you could, you can you can find any way, many any number of ways to exploit things that are going to hurt other people and then live off that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to find somebody who's non-exploitative way to support that so that the work that I did could just be the work that I want to do, not have to be connected to that. So that, that's the end goal, yeah. creative stability. I've written a book on meditation as a practice. For a long time I wrote a blog called Love Life Practice and now I do most of my writing on medium.com. So okay. um, I mentioned my writing at, at, at Gray Miller, G-R-A-Y-M-I-L-L-E-R. And uh, yeah, look for books on Amazon and things like that. How do you like writing on Medium? I've tried it a little bit. I don't really care for their whole like changing to the subscription format. I mean, so I am literally looking at Medium as a, as a source of income. Okay, you are. But having come to it from seven years of writing a personal development blog where I did not get any income from it, mm -hmm. it's like, hey, oh, you're going to pay me beer money this month that's fine maybe i'll make more so ask me again in a couple of months i've only i've only been doing it really seriously for the month of november you can learn more about gray miller at his website graymillercreative.com the music for this episode is by my band lorenzo's music at lorenzosmusic.com and if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. I'll be back next week. So until then, so long.